All right, hello, hello. I'm finally getting around to Exodus 40. We are wrapping up the book of Exodus. Uh, I know I've been doing this for a while and I know my videos are very spread out, but it's just crazy to me that I made it this far. Uh, my wife and I just went out on the uh, deck last night since summer weather. We haven't had, got a lot of chance to sit out there and enjoy it with her going through uh, the hormones of pregnancy and the nausea and everything. And we were looking out on the land, you know, this is where I grew up and then we bought it from my parents and just how much it changed from when I was a kid, you know, over the years, my dad tearing down old hog units, outdoor hog units, putting up new gardens, planting new trees, taking down fence lines, putting up fence lines. And then just, uh, the work that we've done in the short time that we've been here for the last little over a year. And it's amazing to see how much things come along a little step at a time. So the one small step at a time, I've lived in three different houses since I started this, uh, gotten married, had a child, my wife's pregnant with another one, and I'm only <laughs> through with the second book of the Bible at, after this video. So we haven't gotten there yet. Fair warning, you hear some white noise. Uh, my wife is still sleeping and my little girl is taking her first nap, so I have her monitor. That's the noise you hear. And if I have to stop in the middle because she wakes up, that will not be good because she just went down. She needs to sleep for at least an hour. Anyway, turn that down just a little bit. Exodus 40. So, again, I've said it every time we do these ones, these are often, especially the back half of Exodus, are the overlooked chapters of the Bible because they're just a little bit, I guess, boring is the, the word that I would use. I don't like to say that, but just compared to the other stories in the Bible, you know, the setting up of the tabernacle is not like on people's high scriptural reference list, but we got to try and take something out of it. I have become very disappointed in the commentaries I find online. And with all the moving, I have commentaries I've gotten from my family, my grandma especially, you know, over the years. Uh, my grandpa had some good ones. Uh, I believe he was a Freemason for a few years, so he probably got some real good ones. <laughs> Illuminati confirmed. So I wish that I could find better ones to help with these the research that I'm doing. But I have put in time in the past, so I'm trying to just recall what I've read uh, from commentaries going back, you know, all the way to high school when I started doing this stuff. All right, so Exodus 40, verse 1. And this is the setting up of the tabernacles, the first part of this chapter. So remember, they put in all this work, they've built everything, they've gotten everything ready, they put their best effort into building something for the Lord, brought the community together for a goal, and is also a goal dedicated to righteousness, you know, the Lord. So it helped to build morale and morals at the same time. So verse one, then the Lord said to Moses, set up the tabernacle, the tent of meeting on the first day of this month, place the Ark of the Covenant law in it and shield the Ark with the curtain, bring the, in the table and set out what belongs on it. Then bring in the lampstand and set up its lamp. Place the gold altar of incense in front of the Ark of the Covenant Law and put the curtain at the entrance to the table, tabernacle. Okay, so this is the stuff that really irked me that I couldn't find more commentary on this because I've seen documentaries and I've read all kinds of stuff about, and I can kind of explain it, but not to the detail of these old commentaries. But here, let's just go over real quick. So it's been a year on the first day of the first month. That indicates that it's been a year since the Israelites left Egypt or came out of Egypt. And so think about everything they've seen over the course of this year. I mean, this includes the Exodus, the fiery pillar in front of them, you know, the tabernacle, Moses turning white, God coming down on the mountain, all this stuff, all these miracles they've seen, the manna in the quail coming. In one year, so this is like peak is real faith, if you can imagine. I mean, even though we know that they're about to not have faith when they go into land and Caleb and his spies see everything or whatever, but they have seen it. Like a lot of people nowadays, you know, blessed are those who believe and who haven't seen, but these people have seen, they've seen it go down. 
The tabernacle had to be built according to the pattern, blah, blah, blah. So it goes through how to arrange everything. So we just read that. And uh, let's move on a little bit closer here. And then I want to get into what I was talking about, the commentary. Because if you notice the setup of everything, it's, it's showing how, like, first you purify yourself with incense, or you offer the purifying sacrifice. Then you go through the incense of peace, and, and the, ta the table is for the communion with the Lord, but that's why you have to purify yourself before you go. It's basically walking you through the steps of how to get into the presence of the Lord. And we now know that it represents what Christ ends up doing for us, and what the ultimate goal is to be able to commune with your Creator. Anyway, verse 6. Place the altar of burnt offering in front of the entrance to the tabernacle. What did I just say? That's how you, it's the burnt offering. So that's to wash away your sins, your transgressions before you can go on. Uh, the tent of meeting. Place the basin between the tent of meeting and the altar and put water in it. Set up the courtyard around it and put the curtain at the entrance of the courtyard. Take the anointing oil and anoint the tabernacle and everything in it. Consecrate it and all its furnishings and it will be holy. Then anoint the altar of burnt offering and all its utensils. Consecrate the altar and it will be mostly and it will, will be most holy. Anoint the basin and stand and consecrate them. Okay, so basically they're just anointing everything. It's kind of like a cleansing process for everything, but also it's more yes, symbolic is the right word, but it's does something to your mind. Like when you go through this process of actually taking the time to put the anointing oil on all the utensils and cleaning them down and you're doing it in reverence of the Lord, think about how much reverence you're going to have for those things and for the Lord going forward. When you, It's the difference between going through the motions and putting your full self into it. You know, uh, you put your full self into it, you get more out of it up here. You know, it trains your mind to think about these things in the right way. So that's what's really going on with the anointing. You know, does really, putting oil on something really do anything? I mean, no. It's what it does to you up here. It's what it does to your focus and your mentality and how you feel about the situation. Uh, you know, that's why so many things are ceremonial. When you go through a ceremony, it makes it bigger to you than what it might actually be. Uh, and again, the commentary is not good. Okay, because again, if you look at the way it's set up, it walks you all the way up. And that's the commentator that I like to see, is the symbolism. Uh, the symbolism of the setting up of the tabernacle. You know, how you slowly walk your way up to the Ark of the Covenant through these sets of purification, communion with the Lord, the incense of the peace incense and things to calm you down, even the lampstands, which represent... Uh, Lampstands often represent the church, the churches. You know, you'll see that in Revelations a lot. That's why some people think the two witnesses are actually two churches. You know, in Revelations, there's three, seven churches that are written to, and two of them are still who are practicing correctly and doing very well. So some people think the two witnesses will be those two churches. So lampstands represent the body of the believers. All right. Bring Aaron and his sons to the entrance to the tent of meeting and wash them with water against the ceremony. So now to them, it becomes more real. It becomes more sacrament. You know, they take it seriously. Then dress Aaron, then dress Aaron in the sacred garments, anoint him and consecrate him so he may save me as, serve me as priest. Bring his sons and dress them in tunics, anoint them just as you anointed their father so they may serve me as priests. Their anointing will be to priesthood that will continue throughout their generations. Moses did everything just as the Lord commanded him. So the tabernacle was set up on the first day of the first month in the second year. When Moses set up the tabernacle, he put the bases in place, erected the frames, inserted the crossbars, and set up the posts. I don't think he did it all himself. Come on, he had some help. Then he spread the tent over the tabernacle and put the covering over the tent as the Lord commanded him. He took the ta tablets of the covenant law and placed them in the ark, attached the poles to the ark, and put the atonement cover over it. 
Then he brought the ark into the tabernacle and hung the shielding curtain and shielded the ark of the covenant law as the Lord commanded him. This commentary is awful. Anyway. Moses placed the table in the tent of meeting on the... Oh, okay. Moses placed the table in the tent of meeting on the north side... Tent of meeting on the north side of the tabernacle outside the curtain and set out the bread on it before the Lord as the Lord commanded him. He placed the lampstand in the tent of meeting opposite the table of the south side of the tabernacle and set up the lamps before the Lord as the Lord commanded him. Moses placed the gold altar in the tent of meeting in front of the curtain and burned fragrant incense on it as the Lord commanded him. Then he put up the curtain at the entrance to the tabernacle. He set the altar of burnt offering near the entrance of the tabernacle, the tent of meeting, and offered on it burnt offerings and grain offerings as the Lord commanded him. He placed the basin between the tent of meeting and the altar and put water in it for washing. And Moses and Aaron and his sons used to it to wash their hands and feet. They washed whenever they entered the tent meeting of meeting or approached the altar as the Lord commanded Moses. Then Moses set up the courtyard around the tabernacle and altar and put up the curtain at the entrance to the courtyard. And so Moses finished the work. Then the cloud covered the tent of meeting and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. Moses could not enter the tent of meeting because the cloud had settled on it and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. In all the travels of the Israelites, whenever the cloud lifted from above the tabernacle, they would set out. But if the cloud did not lift, they did not set out until the day li it lifted. So the cloud of the Lord was over the tabernacle by day, and fire was in the cloud by night, in the sight of the Israelite during the, all their travels. All right, so again, what we have here is a community project that was done for the Lord. Okay, they've seen all these miracles. They've also seen what their wickedness can do. Because remember what Moses, what God had Moses do to all the unfaithful after the golden calf incident. And they're seeing these miracles. They're seeing all this stuff. So now they know the power of the Lord, even though they should have known it after the Egyptian plagues. But they really have a firm understanding of the power of the Lord and that he is trying to help them. Now, they may not have totally grasp that, but they have seen it with their own eyes. They come together for a community project, which is for this Lord. So you've seen the miracles. Now you are working for this God. You're going to have some more reverence for it, some even more. It's not just going through the motions, nail, you know, whatever, whatever. It's every little detail God gives you specifics for it. And you've seen how kind of unforgiving he can be. I mean, we know God is a forgiving God, but how he wants them to be to the details. So they take it seriously. That's what all this anointing and everything also is. Like I mentioned, ceremonies make things seem more, uh, it clicks more for you. You know, they've done studies on this where, you know, it could be a worthless painting, but if you have a rope around it, people, ooh, ooh, ooh they will just automatically assume it's worth more money and, and all kinds of things like it, it, just people wearing a rubber glove to pick up something people will be more <gasps> it's the symbolism is so the anointing of the oil makes you take it more seriously and the way that it's set up like i mentioned it shows the path of what we as people have to do to get to that communion with the lord uh, you know there's the offering that you have to do the burnt offering the, the offering for your sins this is Jesus, you know, and the purification that you go through through accepting Jesus represented through the sacrifice and the incense that you go through. And eventually you get to that table with, you know, the Lord is there with the bread. That's the communion. God created us to be able to commune with us. But why would he want to commune with somebody who doesn't have the discipline to follow his laws and also doesn't have the ability to see that his laws are righteous and would want to. You know, you don't, you don't want to invite people over who are awful people, who are jerks, 
you know, you don't want to invite people over who are going to treat you poorly, who might rob, steal, talk bad, gossip, and just all around crappy person to be around. No, you want good people to commune with, to come over for your barbecue, to hang out with. People who are interesting and have intellect and compassion and kindness and caring and ambition to do what's right. So this is what God looks for in the people that he wants to commune with. He wants us to follow his laws, wants us to follow Christ, to be purified through Christ so that we can commune with him. That's what the tabernacle, that's what the, all this represents. From the beginning, from the very beginning of creation, you know, God created all this stuff for love so that we would understand love, so that he, he would have something to love and that we would love him because of his love for us. And in the end, we would come and be able to sit and commune with him in his glory. I mean, you think about it, I don't like to put human emotions on God or anything, but it would be a lonely existence if you didn't have anyone ever to commune with. So he created us for the communion. But again, he doesn't want just anybody. He wants us to freely choose to follow him, to purify ourselves through accepting Christ. By accepting Christ, again, that means following his teachings. Okay, there's a lot of people out there who accept Christ. They say, oh yeah, I believe in Christ, he died for my sins. But they don't know the first thing about his teachings. And don't forget, the Bible does say, Christ himself says that, you know, there will be many that come to him calling his name and he will say, you know, he'll turn away from them or whatever, uh, you know, I knew you not. Because you may have been calling on his name for forgiveness, but you weren't seeking out his teachings. You weren't trying to live by his teachings and praying for the, uh, the willpower or the strength to defeat your sins so that you can continue to become a better person. So again, the way the tabernacle's set up, it's to represent what we have to go through to get to that communion, to get closer to God. That's the whole lineup of getting there. And I just find it sad that, you know, churches don't always teach this stuff uh, because it's when this was written, when this was happening, it would have been pretty well understood. I mean, they would have talked about it. So for generations, they would have understood what the representation of all this stuff was. Uh, and it would have made more sense when Jesus came along, you know, and we'd be able to tie them together a lot more. But like so many things, the Bible is just, uh, it's like a textbook. Textbook doesn't give you like the de exact details. Sometimes on the footnotes on the side it does. But the textbooks is just kind of telling you the general story. You know, if you want a more in depth into the uh, Civil War, then you would go and read, you know, diaries and journals of the generals who fought and firsthand accounts. I mean, you have the general understanding of it from the textbook, and that's what the Bible is. This is the general understanding. If you want to understand it more, you would have to go to more text to understand the symbol. Oh, this is what that represents. Oh, this is what they were talking about. Oh, this is the meaning of that word. So that makes, this makes more sense. Anyway, I'm sure I'm going on a tangent and I apologize that I did not in these last few chapters have better commentary. I'm going to end up cleaning all of our books out of storage so I can find my old commentaries because the Bible is weird. Websites I know used to have this information. It's not there anymore. Like one of the most popular Google ones that will pop up is Enduring Word Bible. And they have like no commentary on any of these Exodus chapters. And I, like I said, I know these are kind of boring overlooked chapters, but that's what makes me want to dive more into them. Like why is it when I was in the Navy, you know, five, six years ago and I'd be bored and I'd look this stuff up, it was just fast, fast paragraphs typed up on every verse on Enduring Word. And now there's like nothing. Why would they remove stuff? It's just, it, it makes it fishy, you know? It's like how they don't talk about the fact that in the 400 years of enslavement, it was a slow walk to slavery. It's not like they were enslaved. You know, after the seven years of famine, they should have left. They should have gone back to their promised land, but they didn't, they stayed because it was easier there and they're slowly walked into slavery. And that's kind of like what happens today. You know, we are a slave to the system. You know, the Jews, Moses went to the elders, had to convince them to just ask Pharaoh for three days off 
And finally, they're like, okay. And Pharaoh wouldn't give them three days off. They were, the elders were kind of like shocked. Like, what? Because they weren't totally aware that they were slaves. Because it's not like they were conquered and enslaved. They were just through their desire for an easier life living near Egypt instead of the hardship of building their own nation in the promised land. You know, that, that was a hard life. Abraham's constantly having to dig new wells and start new crops and deal with the local uh, tribes that might want to kill him. Egypt and the Goshen area, that's easier until so they're slowly walked into slavery. And that's not the way it's taught in churches. And the Enduring Word Bible has removed a lot of that stuff. And I find it sad because then people can't understand how they today could slowly and are slowly being walked into slavery. Again, another tangent. I apologize. Uh, again, simple man study of the Bible. I enjoy doing this. I wish I had more time to kind of do one of these every day. I wish I was better at editing videos, but I really want to uh, get going on it. So hopefully we can get Leviticus started within the next couple days. Hope everyone's having a wonderful summer so far, or whenever you're watching this, whatever season it is. So good afternoon, good evening, good night, and God bless.